Back in the very early days of the automobile, it was common for manufacturers to produce a car on not just what looked like a horse carriage, but on what had formerly been an actual horse carriage, or at least had been built for that purpose. The carriage being a conveniently available basis on which to put their newfangled electric motors or infernal, sorry, internal combustion engines, notwithstanding the mixture of horror and terror that came along with the transition to horseless carriages, it made a lot of sense to utilise the skills and knowledge of those who'd been building transportation devices for a very long time. I mean, if someone knows how to build a thing, and your thing is very similar, why not use that knowledge? And while there were some very early purpose-built vehicles, the 1885 Benz Tricar comes to mind, it was a pretty slow transition from the jalopy being a hand-built carriage to the modern unibody construction that most cars are today. During that slow transition there was a good long period where nearly all vehicles were built on a separate chassis, and their pretty looking top half was made by a carriage works who'd traditionally built the bodies for horse-drawn carriages, which made for a lot of variety in the way that cars both looked and indeed were controlled. We made a video, which is here, about how Tesla's new yoke control is part of a long tradition of the evolution and variation of vehicle controls, a process that goes back to the dawn of the car. And at several points during the car's evolution we've had exciting periods where anything goes seemed to be the motto when ideas that seem outlandish or wild can gain traction or even break the mould of just what a car should be, often at technological inflection points like when front wheel drive and transverse engines became de rigueur for the smaller mass market vehicles, or when there's been political or financial instability. And just as back in the 1960s with the oil crisis, when there was a sudden resurgence of interest in both electric vehicles, but also in small quirky vehicles, we've also seen something similar, as EVs have started their transition again from experimental and niche to mainstream. So before we look at where we are now, let's just take a moment to admire some of the EVs and human electric hybrids that have got us here, because some of them are spectacularly odd. And we could start at any point in the history of the car. I mean, the 1940s has the electric egg, or l'oeuf électrique, uh, excuse my French. And obviously, as I mentioned, there's a whole raft of 60s and 70s vehicles, the Enfield 8000, a car I briefly owned and have actually driven, albeit just once, and the Sebring City car, the Carter Coaster. It's it's not just the small startups either who were in on this effort. AMC obviously had the Ami car, which sort of begat the EVA Pacer, and even Ford had the Commuter, which I believe they made all of two of. But since I think it was pretty influential, at least for two members of the team, I certainly love it, um, I'm gonna go with the amazing human electric hybrid that was the Sinclair C5. This electrically assisted recumbent bike arose out of Sinclair's small C1 electric vehicle project in the 1980s. Unfortunately hampered by Sinclair's notorious cost cutting and Sinclair's reluctance to even attempt to improve battery technology, the delightfully entertaining C5 had a top speed of just 15 miles per hour and a range of only 20. But it actually sported a Lotus design chassis and, reportedly, handled really well. Whether or not that inspired the vehicle that Nicky once owned, the City L, is unclear, but there's certainly a hint of family resemblance. Or maybe it's just convergent evolution. But look, as major automakers have been laggards in the race to electrify, what we've seen is a real diversity of solutions in the marketplace, as individuals and small companies have realised the economics of building a prototype electric vehicle are much easier to work out than the economics of building a prototype gasoline car. A wide range of motors, controllers and chargers are available off the shelf and relatively easily switched. Batteries can be bought from any number of suppliers who build you packs in a variety of sizes and shapes, and hell, I inquired about a pack for the miner about six years ago from one small company and still get random on-spec emails from companies saying, would I be interested in their lithium iron packs for my project? But it's not just economics, the gasoline engine forces certain design decisions. 
Part of why most cars look fairly similar structurally is that physics and aerodynamics just work the way they do. Part of it is that humans are the shape they are, and you have to accommodate humans in cars, at least at the moment. And part of it is that people generally like familiar shaped objects. But that final part? That's that you need a gas tank, you need an exhaust, you need to have space for all the ancillaries for the engine, and they've all got to be, more or less, near the actual engine. So that means you need a biggish volume box up front, in the middle, or at the back, to plonk the engine and associated ancillary bits and bobs in. That's not so true for EVs, where the components are smaller and can be more flexibly located which has meant that there have been some pretty interesting concepts. Some things, like the pebble or the biohybrid, rely on humans providing a chunk of the motive power, and use motors like the venerable C5 or countless electric bicycles to assist. Some, like the Electric Mechanica Solo, the Archimoto FUV, and the Aptera, all of which we've had test drives of, by the way, they're linked below, are attempting to navigate the challenges of efficiency, or of space utilisation, or of just being something that's plain different and fun. Some, like Canoe, or the IEVX, or the Zev Yo Yo, or indeed the dreadfully cute Micro Lino, are changing the way that cars are made, and the default assumptions about the shapes and structures that cars should have. Many of them are smaller than traditional vehicles have been, and when mainstream automakers started to gingerly dip their toes into EVs, some of them went quite off -piste. The BMW i3 that's recently discontinued, a car that Winter and I have very much a love-hate relationship with, is a really exceptional piece of design and engineering. Advanced in ways that pretty much no other mass-produced vehicle from a mainstream automaker is, with its carbon fibre life module, plastic body panels, and a diverse range of more sustainable materials. Or of course Renault, with their Twizy, another vehicle which I am lucky enough to have spent some time behind the wheel of, and for which there is no other equivalent from another mainstream automaker. Not only that, but it's a vehicle that has been remarkably successful. All of these vehicles break the mould in some way or another, and some of them have been quietly successful. Some of them have been epic Kickstarter failures and seem on the verge of disappearing into obscurity. But with the emergence of mainstream automakers either embracing or being compelled to produce EVs, we have passed through a brief golden age of innovation and emerged back stunned and blinking into the world of the normal. Or have we? I'm sorry to say, probably. When the Sono Scion hit Kickstarter, it was really pleasing. There wasn't anything to compete with it from major automakers, and there were plenty of people crying out for a small, practical city EV, with or without solar panels. And while it's not a wildly different take on the car, it certainly managed to challenge some design conventions. Canoe managed some real changes, although I do see hints of an FC Landy and a Corvair ramp side in the pickup variants. Mainstream automakers had not met that need because, well, the market for people who wanted a small car and wanted it to be an EV was, at that point, small enough that they could easily ignore it. The profit margins weren't there, and there wasn't any legislative reason they had to do it. The entire landscape has shifted though, and so has the perspective of automakers. In Europe, for example, there's a raft of smaller EVs available, adding a ton of competition for Sono's yet-to-be-released product. And to some extent, automakers have to sell EVs, because in many parts of the world, within 10 years, or just a couple of product cycles, they won't have a choice if they want to sell cars. But also, it's become apparent that building a compelling EV, one that's reliable and desirable, is not as easy as it might look. It actually takes expertise and practice, so leaving that transition to the last moment is starting to look more and more like a foolish decision. Especially as legacy brands have produced better, more competent EVs, and as expectations regarding things like charging abilities increase, the knowledge base and engineering prowess required to build a vehicle that works the way consumers are coming to expect is a world away from when throwing a motor in a modified ice car body and 3 kilowatts charging from a household outlet was considered good enough. As most automakers have demonstrated, getting EVs right is something that takes some finessing and 
Putting the work in now is groundwork for a few years away when internal combustion becomes more of the fossil than it already is, and their current cash cow ice engines are both due for replacement because they're getting a bit old. Oh, and because they're not allowed to sell them anymore. But also it's turned out that the flexibility that EV platforms offer has allowed automakers to let their designers really run free. While you might have expected to see the Citroen Ami or the Honda e at an auto show as a concept a decade ago, you wouldn't really have expected them to make it to production. And it's almost certainly the switch to EVs that's made that kind of vehicle possible. So will we see more small makers coming up from nothing to become the next Tesla? It seems pretty unlikely. Elon certainly got his timing right on that one. But now he's dragged the rest of the car industry along for the ride, it seems like the door may have ended up closing behind him. But what I think we will continue to see is interesting niche market solutions for cities and alternative uses. The low down weight of an EV makes single seaters much more stable and much more realizable. And the flexibility of where components have to be that allows for people's flights of fantasy to become reality. So it seems likely that one-up vehicles and other unorthodox arrangements will continue to be an unmet need which new makers can fill using the EV platform's flexibility. And the other area where I hope and believe we'll continue to see some unconventional solutions from startups is pedal-assisted delivery vehicles. Getting these popularized into market is still going to be a challenge. Just look at the struggles of biohybrid. But the regulatory constraints are so much smaller and the opportunities are huge. I suspect, however, that Canoe is probably the last full-size car design pioneer that has even a hope of coming to market, at least that we'll see for a while. What do you think? Will we get more quirky vehicles hitting the streets or are we back to a new normal? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, play nice. That's it for today. Please do hit subscribe and the bell if you haven't yet, as it should make sure you don't miss out on our vids. And please do the same for our other two channels, Transport Evolved Take 2 and, if you're in a hurry, Transport Evolved Shorts. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month patrons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahoa, Brophy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Regine Fellows, Kyle Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tesla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Kofi. Chat with the team and TE fans over at Discord. We're getting very close to our 1,000th Patreon, and we've got some super cool ideas for how to celebrate. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving! <laughs>